Hello. Welcome again to a session of uh, digital slide review and sign out on topics in surgical pathology. I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel and uh, coming to you from the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, uh, vis uh, visualized here in the background. Uh, our program today is part of the Digital Anatomic Pathology Academy, um, courtesy of the Digital Pathology Association and PATH presenter. Uh, we're talking today about a uh, a uh, somewhat unique case, uh, a challenge in GYN and GI pathology, uh, maybe with some interspersed aspects of uh, breast and uh, cutaneous pathology mixed in. Um, it's a 50-year-old woman who has presented with sort of an anorectal and perineal mass. It's uh, uh, several centimeters in size um, and has uh, grown slowly over the last uh, little period of time. Um, so as we think about lesions that can occur in this uh, location, uh, obviously this is a, a border zone between uh, gynecologic, uh, cutaneous, and uh, GI pathology. Um, and so understandably, uh, the uh, lesions that we may encounter uh, in our practices can uh, uh, come from any of those different uh, domains. Um, certainly the neoplasms can be both uh, HPV and non-HPV related squamous lesions. Uh, you can, of course, get enteric lesions. Um, you can get uh, glandular Paget's type, disease type lesions, uh, either primary or related to underlying enteric uh, carcinomas. Uh, and then you have the cutaneous lesions, the adnexal tumors. Um, we see some of those from time to time, um, as well as uh, the less common stromal neoplasms that can also arise either from a more gynecologic orientation or sometimes purely soft tissue uh, or even GI stromal uh, type lesions. Of course, some very common vascular lesions, hemorrhoids can occur in these, uh, this area uh, and the reactive inflammatory lesions like solitary rectal ulcer syndrome also uh, can be a bane in this uh, location and sometimes can masquerade as uh, cutaneous lesions. Of course, then you have uh, fistulae and various other uh, things that can be manifestations of Crohn's disease or other um, uh, things. So it becomes a very complex area in terms of the uh, intersection of differing types of pathology that can be encountered. And of course, that's what makes it uh, challenging and interesting. So uh, today's case uh, is uh, just such a case. Uh, as you see here, uh, a centimeter, two centimeter size lesion, uh, low magnification, somewhat polypoid, uh, with uh, an apparent mixture of patterns, both sort of sieve-like glandular as well as more solid areas, uh, maybe some ulceration here uh, as we look at uh, the uh, low magnification. Uh, coming into a higher magnification, we'll focus first on this solid component here. Um, and we see that uh, this has uh, some areas with uh, apparent keratinization or uh, epidermoid uh, character. Uh, maybe even some little uh, squamous pearls uh, drifting off into the lumina uh, here. Um, other solid areas show uh, um, a sort of uh, a ductal type of uh, structure uh, developing, as you see here, uh, little tubular glands. Um, and then in addition, uh, we have these uh, sort of uh, duct-like structures uh, with uh, uh, somewhat columnar type uh, lining cells, fairly uh, malignant looking. Uh, so that certainly is uh, a part of the picture that we're seeing here. Uh, and then we have this very peculiar and quite cellular stroma in areas. Uh, here we can see that it's uh, uh, got a mixture of sort of uh, collagenous and almost smooth muscle-like appearance, uh, fairly uh, cellular, not particularly atypical in this location. Um, but it does appear to have an associated stroma. For example, over here, uh, we can see a characteristic uh, more myxoid change to the stroma here, uh, and the beginnings uh, maybe of a little bit more atia. Um, and then uh, looking here uh, near this ulcerated area, this is not just uh, ulcerated uh, granulation tissue. This is fairly dense cellular uh, tissue uh, with a more monomorphic uh, type of pattern albeit with this uh, surface ulceration. Uh, so uh, if we were thinking this might be a solitary rectal ulcer, uh, I think we'd want to think again. Uh, notice here we have uh, 
uh, surface involvement by uh, the neoplasm. Um, and here we see little papillae in some of these uh, ductile-like uh, structures, uh, as well as this uh, uh, spindle-shaped stroma associated with it in areas, and a little bit of vascular ectasia. So uh, let's look uh, a little further and look here, here at this area uh, as well, uh, emphasizing here this more uh, squamoid surface uh, with the underlying areas of uh, squamous uh, differentiation here. Uh, and then look at this uh, stroma uh, with uh, sort of a mixoid appearance, uh, very uh, cellular, a um, little bit of atypia in some of these cells. Uh, not just a uh, bland uh, background type of stroma. Here's another area, and we see uh, intermixed uh, racemos uh, pattern of uh, uh, infiltrative, uh, rather poorly differentiated cells. Um, they look a little bit uh, different from the uh, squamous, more typical squamous areas, but they're associated with this uh, transition. Uh, to the stromal component. And so we might begin to think about an epithelial to mesenchymal transformation, uh, as we see here, a more characteristic uh, sort of uh, sarcomatoid uh, pattern or sarcomatous carcinoma uh, that has uh, developed in this particular area here. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, again, a part of the uh, lesion that we're seeing here. Uh, looking at uh, another of these areas, let's look at this more uh, glandular uh, area here. Um, and here we can see uh, this uh, rather papillary type of uh, lesion uh, with uh, small and large papillae, uh, variable amounts of uh, stratified and uh, sort of uh, almost uh, hobnailing of some of the cells, uh, as well as more columnar uh, epithelial cells. Um, and some sloughing and bizarre giant cells uh, in these areas as well. Uh, now, if you don't pay much attention to the, uh, uh, to the uh, cytology per se, you might look at this and say, well, this looks very much like a hydratinoma uh, or hydratinoma papilliferum. Um, but the combination of squamoid and these uh, uh, sweat, sweat gland-like uh, structures, ductal structures, uh, certainly raises uh, the consideration of a more uh, epithelial derived type of tumor or cutaneous, excuse me, cutaneous adnexal derived tumor uh, that we might think of uh, in uh, this sort of a circumstance. And here we see, again, more of this uh, mixed uh, cribriform ductal columnar and solid areas with this uh, atypical stroma uh, that we've seen. And you notice here we're right up against uh, the anal transition zone uh, in this uh, lesion. So uh, this obviously is not a frequently encountered lesion, or I probably wouldn't be discussing it here if this were a common everyday uh, case. Um, and it raises the issue of uh, what do we do when we encounter something that you haven't seen before? Um, and uh, I, I use the phrase unicorns, zebras, or donkeys, maybe you could say horses, uh, for the truly unique and unheard of, the very uncommon, and the everyday. Um, because uh, truth be told, um, common things in uncommon sites are more common than rare things in any site. And so usually you have to be thinking hoofbeats, horses, or donkeys. Uh, even though we may be in an unusual location. Um, and so uh, what is common that could look like this? Um, well, we've mentioned hydratinoma papilliferum and so forth, uh, a little bit of an unusual site, but not impossible. Um, another uh, thing that I would use is, is check the history um, and look for clues, uh, look for prior tissue, look for uh, syndromes, look for other associations uh, that can tell you more about this patient. Uh, as one of my mentors uh, used to say, if you listen long enough to the patient, they will eventually tell you what the diagnosis is. Well, that's a little bit more difficult in pathology uh, because the way we have to listen to the patient uh, isn't direct. 
uh, more frequently it's indirect through uh, historical uh, documents uh, or through calling and asking questions. Uh, the other thing to consider, especially in a location like this, is what's the embryology? Uh, what, uh, what are the, uh, the uh, etiologic events that happen during embryology that could uh, pr produce uh, an unusual finding in an atypical location or a common finding in an uncommon location? And then look for background clues that tell you uh, where you may be. Uh, do I have a rim of compressed normal adrenal? Uh, do I have uh, some other basal or banal tissue structure that's nearby? And once we've done all these things, then you begin to develop some sort of a, an approach that may help you uh, so that using immunohistochemistry uh, for a reason, rather than just slapdash uh, asking, uh, uh, this is my list of uh, cases, a list of stains, I'll, I'll put all of them on and see what comes out. Well, that leads to confusion and chaos, and a lot of uh, potentially misleading information can come out of that. But if we're uh, thinking uh, wisely and can use uh, immunochemistry judiciously to assign lineage, uh, determine possible etiologic uh, factors, uh, then we can begin to get uh, further clues. And then finally, uh, pathology is a team sport, uh, and we love to share cases because we need each other. Uh, and we need the different perspectives, the backgrounds that people have in terms of case experience, in terms of areas of specialization, in terms of the way their minds work, uh, as well as what they've studied or written about that can help us uh, in this uh, sort of a situation. And all of those sorts of things approached in this case uh, led to a diagnosis. So uh, one of the things that was applied was some immunohistochemistry. Uh, and here we see that uh, with this particular stain, um, we can identify that uh, we have um, some areas that are positive um, and some areas that are negative. So we see that some of these more glandular elements uh, and the stromal elements are not particularly staining with this uh, marker. Um, and so uh, not surprisingly, uh, this is a uh, squamous marker, a marker for P63, and thus we can see it marking some of the myoepithelial cells and the ductal elements, as well as the solid squamous uh, areas. Um, and those two patterns are evident. Uh, we see it on the surface, we see it uh, surrounding some of the ductal structures, and we see it in the solid component of the tumor. But where we don't see it is in any of the atypical stroma, um, and we don't see it uh, in uh, very much of the purely glandular uh, or papillary component other than the uh, myoepithelial cells. Now notice here that some of these other even pure ductal areas uh, have uh, little or none of it as well. So that tells us that there's a squamous component to this tumor. There's a myoepithelial component around some of these ducts, uh, but there are more things here uh, as well. Uh, here, we can see a, uh, a different pattern. Um, and uh, this, um, I think you can infer from what we're seeing here, um, is uh, a little bit different stain. Uh, this is our um, P16 stain. So uh, that's very helpful in this location to suggest that this lesion uh, harbors um, potentially a uh, HPV-driven uh, transformation. And that transformation affects not just the squamous, but the glandular, uh, as well as uh, many of the areas of our stromal transformation, which also uh, express this uh, marker fairly strongly in the nuclei, you can see here, uh, and to some degree in the cytoplasm. So there is a broad range uh, driver here that may be related to HPV, or at least is indicative of uh, a mutational status in the uh, E6 or E7 um, uh, cofactor uh, that is associated with uh, P16. And then uh, finally here, uh, we come up with a, uh, a pancytokeratin stain 
Um, I believe this is uh, CK56. Um, and notice that here we do stain some of these uh, uh, atypical stromal cells. So we see some uh, staining uh, in these uh, stromal cells that uh, is the pattern that is often associated with the sarcomatous uh, transformation, um, this pattern of keratin staining. Um, we see it in the solid areas, and we see it here also in these glandular and tubular areas as well uh, as this uh, uh, finely gl fine glandular area. So uh, there's some helpful uh, uh, things. So let's just talk a little bit about sarcomatous transformation um, as we work towards the diagnosis here. Uh, this was originally hypothesized when I was a trainee as a, potentially a collision tumor of, of two tumors or perhaps a composite clone uh, of a single tumor, tumor um, with a divergent differentiation and so forth. Uh, but it's now recognized that this epithelial to mesenchymal transformation most often derives from some sort of pluripotent stem cell a tumor stem cell, if you will, uh, that then undergoes successive stepwise mutations, uh, resulting in uh, the more polyclonal um, manifestations in these very complex uh, tumors. Um, there are several signaling pathways that appear to be involved. And remarkably, as we begin to study these uh, in multiple organ systems, um, <clears throat> they all seem to uh, have some similar factors. Uh, whether they're seen in the GU system, whether they're head and neck tumors, whether they're skin tumors uh, derived from the breast or some other location, pancreas, et cetera, et cetera. One of my colleagues at the University of Missouri, a former trainee here, uh, Knight wrote this nice article about this uh, transformation to sort of delineate what is some of the factors are that are involved. He identified TGF beta as being one of the primary signals that's involved, and that can uh, impact several different pathways, including the PI3K, uh, the SMAD uh, pathway, as well as the uh, HIO5 pathway. Uh, <clears throat> wind signaling through beta catenin may also be involved. Um, and there's uh, certainly evidence that, you know, the MAPK pathway and other uh, differentiators along this process uh, can all be involved with activating this uh, mesenchymal gene process and thus expression of both the epithelial and mesenchymal uh, features. And this seems to be critically involved with the ability to invade uh, and to spread. Well, uh, this lesion is uh, also uh, likely a skin or mammary related lesion um, <clears throat> because the uh, sarcomatous transformation of um, a syringocyst adenoma, which is what we believe or syringocyst adenoma papilliferum carcinoma, syringocyst adenocarcinoma uh, is the uh, lesion that we believe we're dealing with here. And that may be related to the mammary ridge um, and uh, ectopic breast tissue. Uh, this little map illustrates all the possible locations where uh, various uh, ectopic uh, mammary tissue has been detected. Um, and although anus is not highlighted here, um, I think this case and a recent case we had uh, which I'll show you here in a moment, uh, highlight that that may be uh, an extension uh, possibility as well. Uh, so um, here's that case, uh, also derived from an, what was thought to be a hemorrhoid. Um, and as we look at it here, um, it has this uh, very classic appearance of a sort of a canalicular fibroadenoma, uh, very similar to what would be seen in breast parenchyma. Um, certainly not characteristic of uh, uh, usual tumors arising primarily from the uh, rectum, uh, certainly not from the anal area, but yet that's where it occurred. And you see it has this uh, intracystic uh, pattern uh, just beneath the squamous mucosa here. Uh, so again, underscoring the fact that uh, uh, cutaneous breast type lesions uh, can occur in and as far away from the uh, breast as uh, these lesions uh, both arising in the anus. So then to uh, sort of conclude today's discussion, our final sign out diagnosis is sarcomatoid transformation of syringocyst adenocarcinoma papilliferum. A uh, highly unique case, but I think illustrating the, some of our approach to uh, zebras and unicorns um, and common and uncommon locations and presentations. 
that are all thoughts worth uh, thinking about as you encounter the challenging cases in your practice. Well, thank you so much for joining us on this uh, exploration of a complex and difficult uh, case. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, hit that uh, subscribe button uh, so that you'll uh, catch future releases uh, from our channel. Uh, we appreciate your support and uh, your uh, comments are always welcomed. Uh, we hope to make uh, our channel worthwhile and valuable to trainees, to patients, and to uh, other indiv interested individuals uh, in a variety of fields. So until next time, thanks so much for joining me.